Episode, we have Canadian environmentalists David Suzuki and Severn Cullis Suzuki. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for watching. This show is all about giving you insights and showcasing brands that help you to live your best life and give you confidence. As always, I want to kickstart your morning with some motivational advice to help you to feel inspired and energized to start your day. Today, I want to talk about understanding why we get stuck in a rut and how to get out of it. The truth is our brains are trained to be on autopilot and continue to do the same thing over and over. Whether those habits are good or bad for us, our brains are programmed to keep doing the same thing repeatedly until we decide to consciously break the pattern. The great thing about this is that we are indeed in control of our minds and have the ability to program our brains to work for us in a positive way and to form new habits. So how do we do this? The first step is making a choice to stop ourselves when we find ourselves falling into old patterns. At that moment, when we find ourselves making the same choices over and over, is the moment we must consciously stop ourselves and take action. Don't overthink it, just do it. For example, if you find yourself not wanting to go to the gym, rather than giving in, make a conscious choice that today is the day things will be different and immediately get up and take action without overthinking. Training your mind to make different decisions is key to getting different results and building momentum. Having a good reason behind why you want to stop doing something is also motivation to keep reminding yourself why it's worth making the effort to break old patterns of behavior. As David Gracioso quotes, please don't ever think that you can't get out of a rut you may be in or think you can't take your life to a whole new level. Anything is possible when you have a path, a plan and a desire to take action. Stay tuned, coming up after the break. And you know, when I interviewed you a couple years ago, that's what you talked about. You said when you love something, you want to take care of it when you were talking about the environment. So for us as everyday people, what can we do to, you know, save our planet other than reduce, reuse, recycle? What are some steps that we can actually do day to day? Well, I see it as two sides of the same coin. We have to, first of all, reduce our own ecological footprint or our carbon footprint. And there are so many ways that we can do that. You know, that's where you have the lists of, you know, how to limit the energy that you consume, how to limit the meat that you that you eat and and how to essentially lighten your foot, your footsteps on the earth. We have to do that. We have to walk our talk. No, I, I agree with what Seth says, you know, on an individual level, we've got really ourselves to look at and how we reduce our, our uh, ecological footprint. But there, you know, we're trapped within the system that is so based on the use of fossil fuel that it becomes very difficult. Wardrobe provided by H&M. Next up on the show, we have Canadian environmentalists, David Suzuki and Severn Cullis Suzuki. Severn and David, thank you so much for being on the show today. How are you both doing? We're both doing well. Uh, uh, Sev's family and, and I uh, are recovering from COVID, so uh, we're happy. At least you guys got over it, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I, I am so excited to have you on the show. I was telling you earlier that, yeah, this, this episode means a lot to me because, David, you were one of my first interviews coming out of college. So to have you back on the show, it means a lot. <laughs> so you know what? It's so great to have a father and daughter uh, duo that are passionate about the environment. So let's get into that. David, I know that your passion for the environment grew um, when you would go camping with your dad. So, so let's talk about that and how it developed a love for nature. You know, I think that it's built into us. I think that we're born with it. If you take a young baby and show it a butterfly or a, or a flower for the first time, you, for that matter, you could show them a spider or a snake. You won't see, ah, you'll see, ah, and you know, often they want to grab it and put it in their mouth because that's <laughs> one of the way they really sense the world around. Uh, E.O. Wilson at Harvard calls this biophilia, that is, it's built into us. And it makes sense, you know, when you think of our evolutionary roots, we were born as a species in Africa, 
And being able to survive in, in those early days meant you had to really observe and, and see the natural world around. Mm -hmm. and, and Wilson thinks that it's it's built into us, and I, I think it is. Uh, Sev, what do you think with with uh, two young boys? Uh, don't you think that it's something we we have? Absolutely. I mean, we are part of the world. We're part of our environment, and um, you know, we've always existed up until now, very much working with the land and the water and animals and plants around us. And it's only very recently in our um, new urban history that we have become more indoor animals mm. and we have kind of disassociate from now what we call nature. Um, you know, I'm currently doing my PhD in anthropology and it's really been um, an honor for me to learn more about different cultures. And one of the things that I, that I noticed for a long time was that most indigenous um, languages don't have a word for nature. Oh. There's no, there's no concept of this nature is this thing that exists as separate from humans. We are part of nature. We're part of our environment. So, you know, yes, you know, it's, we, I think E.O. Wilson's absolutely right. We have a natural love of the life around us, but ultimately we have never truly been separate from, separate from that. And we like to think we are today, but in reality, it's uh, simply not true. But you know, Sev, I, I, I think it's right. Most people now live in big cities. You know, that's become our urban habitat. And uh, I think we tend to inculcate a sense of biophobia because we go, oh, don't touch that, you know, it might bite or, uh, oh, it might be poisonous, uh, you know, get it out of here. You know, I, I'm always amazed when I see people that if they see an ant in the house, they get all freaked out because <laughs> it doesn't belong in our house. And so we te we're teaching children to feel that kind of separation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Severn, you know, what are some memories that you had growing up that kind of sparked your interest? Because obviously your dad's such a notable environmentalist. Well, I was very lucky to also grow up in a family that loved going camping, as dad grew up in a family that loved going camping, um, spending time outside. And so living in BC and also in Toronto, um, I was able to explore in the in uh, more of the remote areas. However, even right in the cities, we were always encouraged to just go outside after school. And so here in Vancouver, we just go to the beach, turning over rocks. But even in our driveway in uh, in the annex in Toronto, you know, we would always be turning over logs or bricks, looking for bugs, looking at insects, <laughs> isopods, worms trying to ID birds that we would see, you know, there's different kind of plants. I remember there was some um, poison ivy that lived um, in the driveway. Um, just there actually is nature even in the heart of our urban centers. And so dad was always taking the time to turn over those rocks and ask the questions. Oh, what's that? You know, do you know what an isopod is? Is that, that's not an insect. What is it? You know, um, but asking those questions and being curious, I think it's such a key, beautiful part about nature, even in our downtown centers. Yeah, but Sev, you're probably too young to remember this, but uh, in the, your early years when we used to ha be in Toronto, Mom and I would be sure on weekends to just go out into the country and look for a ditch or a pond. And I remember one time uh, we had you out there and of course you're wading in these ditches and you came up and said, Daddy, Daddy, what's this? And it was a leech, a leech oh. right on, you know, between your fingers. Oh. And kind of my stomach kind of went, look, and I had to say, Oh dear, that's a leech. Now look at it. You know, it but those are uh, early days to, uh, to, to see nature. Absolutely. And, and speaking about nature, I want to talk about climate change because, you know, it's evident to everyone. We see places like BC snowing and the weather erratically changing. It's actually pretty scary. So what do you think the causes for that are? Let's start with you, um, David. Well, you know, I think to really understand why we're in a pickle now, you have to remember that life 
evolved, we think, on the planet about 3.9 to 4 billion years ago. And for millions and hundreds of millions of years, there was no oxygen in the air. Uh, oxygen is a very reactive element. Uh, if oxygen's there, it rusts things or it, it oxidizes things and it disappears. It was really when plants evolved photosynthesis, they began to take carbon dioxide out of the air and replace it with oxygen. And over hundreds of millions of years, they built up the oxygen rich atmosphere that animals like us depend on. Before plants, animals like us couldn't survive uh, on the planet. And over billions of years, then you had this balance between the plants taking carbon dioxide out of the air, putting oxygen back in it. And we were part of that, breathing in oxygen, putting out carbon dioxide, the plants were taking. So there was this balance of carbon dioxide and oxygen. A lot of the plants that died then went built into the ground and they had all of this carbon built into their bodies. And over hundreds of millions of years, they were pressed down and eventually that carbon became uh, um, coal and oil and and gas. Mm -hmm. So the fossil fuels are the carcasses of plants that were built on carbon over many, many uh, years. And we really began to change that balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide because we, we found these reserves of fossil fuels and began to release that carbon far faster than nature itself could reabsorb. And that's the problem we face, is that modern industrial society is based on the fact that we're burning so much fossil fuel, really liberating so much carbon, that all of the green things in the oceans and on land can't take it back fast yeah. enough. So it's building up. Mm -hmm. And that acts like a blanket then and captures heat and keeps it. And so the planet is warming. The consequences, yeah. of course, are immense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Seven, what are your thoughts on this? Well, it's very clear what is happening now. Humans are very smart. We've got these really big brains, these really big, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, possibilities for analysis and we have this amazing communication and technology that we use all the time that's based on humans analyzing and um, predicting the future and so we live in a, in a world that's completely dependent on technology and on this analysis and evaluation and on data and yet now we're getting information and data that we're changing the atmosphere we're pumping so much pollution into um, the atmosphere that is thickening the heat trapping blanket of greenhouse gases around the planet and now it's wreaking havoc on our climate things are erratic totally different and new weather patterns are starting mm -hmm. and we're suddenly saying no we're not really sure if that is true or we're not really paying attention to that data and using it to inform our actions even yeah. though we use data and information in everything we do now mm -hmm. it's so inconvenient to think of the reality that we have to change our dependency on fossil fuels that is built into everything in our yeah. infrastructures of life. So we really have to um, transform how we are using energy, how we are getting around, how we are eating food. We have to address all of these things if we want it to stop getting even worse. Yeah, absolutely. And we're also seeing a lot of endangered species, you know, from polar bears to the bee population. So is there any way to prevent this from happening? Well, I think the uh, the big challenge is one species is really dominating the planet. We've taken over the planet and uh, in the demand to serve our economies and our political agendas, it means we continue to assault uh, uh, nature. You know, my I've always, since I was a child, loved insects. I was always interested in beetles. I think they're such incredible uh, animals. Insects are the most diverse, the most abundant, the most important species uh, of uh, animal species on the planet. If, if all human beings disappeared overnight, the, the world would 
rebound and green itself and animals would come out of the the woodwork and they'd begin to re repopulate the world but if all insects disappeared overnight our terrestrial ecosystems all kinds of species that depend on them would die hmm. so you see the impact of these tiny creatures but we've declared war on them i mean there is an armageddon going on with insects now and reports are finally coming out this rapid destruction of uh, insect species that are so important on the planet just for pollinating flowering plants you know let alone all the other things they do like feed fish and feed birds and 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 other things so i think uh, to say how do we you know allow we we're concerned about the big cute and cuddly things you know polar bears and cheetahs and and though and whales but you know we don't think that what we've done is spread poison in the air water and soil they're called insecticides to kill insects that are having a devastating impact and they're still piling up in the uh, in the biosphere Rachel Carson warned about this in 1962 and we continue to just work and work and pump more pesticides out there and so you ask you know how how can we how can we protect these animals? Well, how can we do that when we're poisoning the planet of some of the key species that keep the planet vibrant and healthy and all these big animals depend on them? Uh, it's, we've got to bring human activity under control and we, we're, we've run out of time. It's got to be done very, very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And what I like is that, you know, the David uh, Suzuki Foundation is, you know, tackling and working on these issues from climate change to protecting at risk ecosystems and species. So, Severin, let's talk about some of the projects that you guys have going on. Well, two um, exciting projects that we're working on right now are really involved in engaging with public about how we can help people from this feeling of being overwhelmed and not wanting to, not knowing what to do and getting active in in our communities so the future ground network and future ground prize is a hub for community action where we provide training and support for people who want to start actions in their communities and the idea is to help foster and encourage all the people that are feeling like we do which is we have to act now there's some major transformation for the worst that are happening in our ecosystems and we have to stop it. Um, and another really exciting project that I absolutely love and this speaks to dad's love of insects is the Butterfly Way project. So community members can directly address habitat loss of butterflies and poll mm. pollinators by planting plants that pollinators like to feed on or is good habitat for them and so a couple years ago this was started just in a few cities and over the last few years and during COVID it has spread across the country we have over a thousand people who have become butterfly rangers mm -hmm. and they are fostering these little mini ecosystems and habitats that then link together so it provides these migrating butterflies with habitat corridors. So it's just just something that I always love hearing about because it's so such a beautiful idea. It's so simple and so clearly a solution and it's really empowering and exciting for our for the participants. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you guys also have a group of experts that come together uh, to create solutions for um, these issues. So, so tell us about these experts and how they come up with these solutions. It's such a privilege to me to work at the Suzuki Foundation because of the amazing people that work there. People are so passionate about the earth. They're passionate about social justice. And they're also just so dedicated and um, they have such a diff big um, diversity of skills. So we have people who really work on policy and who are looking at analyzing what are the best ways of decarbonizing? You know, what are, how, how do, are we gonna get to zero carbon by 2050? And what are the pathways on how to do that? We have people who are coming at climate change um, or mitigation from a legal standpoint and looking at what are the legal ways that we can we can use tools to ensure that in the future we have legal systems that are actually supporting 
a decarbonized world. Because right now our laws and systems, everything supports the way it is right now, which is carbon destroying. We have people who are working on nature and ensuring that we have a climate resilient, a climate change resilient world. You know, we can't just address climate change and the pollution we're putting into our atmosphere. We also have to strengthen our existing ecosystems. And so that's a really important part of the work that we have to do, ensuring that we are restoring, that we are rewilding, that we are rebuilding the natural relationships and natural ecosystems that we, we need if we're going to make it. Yeah, absolutely. And but, you, you know, know, if I could just add something, I really think that the important thing is what is going to, must drive us is love. And, and by that, I mean, you know, if you love your children, I mean, why do we have children if, if it's not to, to have these most important people in our lives that we love? And realize, you know, the message that Greta Thunberg has been saying is that the, that the future for children is, is really grim. We've got to act now. Mm -hmm. If we love our children, we have to do everything we can for them. And what is that? We have to love nature because nature ultimately, uh, you know, is the source of our our oxygen in the atmosphere and, and all of the things that we need to, uh, to survive and flourish. So I really think at its heart, we've got to, to learn to love the things that really matter. Our children matter, and our children's future is tied up in the future of, of the natural world, and we've got to, uh, to love and embrace that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when I interviewed you a couple years ago, that's what you talked about. You said when you love something, you wanna take care of it when you were talking about the environment. So for us as everyday people, what can we do to you know, save our planet other than reduce, reuse, recycle? What are some steps that we can actually do day to day? Well, I see it as two sides of the same coin. We have to, first of all, reduce our own ecological footprint or our carbon footprint. And there are so many ways that we can do this. You know, that's where you have the lists of, you know, how to limit the energy that you consume, how to limit the meat that you that you eat and and how to essentially lighten your foot, your footsteps on the earth. We have to do that. We have to walk our talk. And the, but the other side is to get political. We have to look at what the issues are systemically and we have to push systemically for change because our individual actions, they will take us so far, but we need systemic transformation to make it easier for us to do the right thing, but also to get at the core infrastructure that is driving so much of the destruction. And so we need to get political. We need to look at our spheres of influence. We need to look at, you know, what our positions are in our jobs, in our personal lives with our friends and think like, how can we start this conversation? How can we organize ourselves so that we are more powerful as a group? How can we you know, call out to our members of this group that I'm part of and say, hey, how are we going to decarbonize? How are we going to stop being part of this problem that is the existential part problem of our time? How are we going to make this an exciting piece of making us feel motivated to, to change the world? I mean, we actually have this incredible moment right now where all of our actions they actually really matter. And I think, you know, COVID has really driven that home. You know, we learned through COVID that our actions, whether or not we wash our hands, whether or not we wear masks, whether we not whether or not we get vaccinated, they actually have a very real effect on someone else. And it's exactly the same with our actions in the world with respect to our carbon carbon footprint, how much pollution we're, we're putting out, how much waste we're putting out, how much we're consuming. These have real effects on the rest of the world and are putting us in the problems that where we are. So if we change that, that makes a big difference and it matters right now. So I yeah. think, you know, it really depends on how we look at it and how we are motivated to actually be part of this transformation that we absolutely need to happen to, to see happening right now. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, what can our political leaders do to prevent climate change? Do you think they're doing enough, David? <laughs> no, I, I agree with what Seb says, you know, on an individual level, we've got really ourselves to look at and how we reduce our, our uh, ecological footprint. But there, you know, we're trapped within the system that is so based 
on the use of fossil fuel that it becomes very difficult. For example, uh, you know, in order to, to do a lot of the uh, the work that I do on on television, I have to fly in jets all over. And uh, you know, I I remember flying into Calgary a few years ago. I haven't flown a jet for over <laughs> two years thanks to COVID. But when I flew into Calgary, I landed and I was waiting for my baggage. And this guy sidled up to me and said, "I sure hope you flew in a solar in a solar uh, fuel <laughs> plane, you bloody hypocrite." And you know, we to get to where we have to uh, to live. We have to change the infrastructure that allows us to do that. And that's not going to be easy. And that's where we need the people that we elect to office to make those big infrastructural change. So that's what we have to do. We have to be politically active, but we also have to act in our our own lives to, to reduce our footprint. And there's a lot of opportunity in both places. I, I just wanted to say about the government because um, if I may, because in March we're going to have our first look at the new co climate plan to meet Canada's commitment to reduce carbon pollution by 40 to 45 percent. So, um, so we're really hopeful and we're really waiting to see with Stephen Guilbeault as Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. We're waiting to see if they're actually, you know, what that plan's going to have. And the plan needs to answer, needs to have an answer for when we're going to have a cap on oil and gas emissions in Canada and how can we make sure that's effective, legally binding and that it can't be undermined. We have to look for if the government's actually going to stop subsidizing and incentivizing climate pollution um, with um, subsidies for oil and gas. We have to look at the, the measures for strengthening methane pollution and we definitely have to make sure that the, it includes an indication that we're going to have a transition from fossil fuels to a just and fair economy that leaves no one behind. So there's a lot that we're going to be looking in there. Mm -hmm. Equity needs to be right there too. And the government is totally, totally can do this. We have seen with COVID that the government can meet an existential crisis and it has to do the same with this, with climate change. Yeah, absolutely. And why do you think climate change has been kind of swept under the rug? I feel like it's something that affects all of us, right? We live on this planet and if something happens to it, we're all at risk. So wh why do you think it's something that, you know, some people didn't even believe in climate change up till, you know, a couple years ago when they saw drastic weather changes. So why do you think that is? David? Because of money. Yeah. Because there's so much money that has been made based on this this uh, fossil fuel economy and it's not a fair economy we have significant like extreme concentration of wealth in the hands of a few and you know those people and the system people are benefiting from the system do not want it to change so there's been a very concerted effort a campaign effort to stop um, the public from really understanding climate change, from believing the science. There's been a very concerted media effort to keep the idea that the scientists aren't really all in agreement, that there's some debate. That was kept alive very, um, very intentionally. Um, and, and the media was definitely participating in it. I mean, it's just been amazing to see a transformation just in the last year when finally the media is, stop, is stopping to, to talk about the debate among scientists and stopping having, you know, people on both sides, so to speak, even though the vast majority of scientists have known this has been a problem for a very long time and, and human cause. So it's there's a reason that we are still just now really opening our eyes to the problems of climate change. Yeah, and I, I think that people should know that in that the fossil fuel industry itself knew darned well that burning fossil fuels was changing the chemistry of the atmosphere. In 1965, Frank Eichard, the the president or CEO of the American Petroleum Institute, which was the organization representing all of the fossil fuel industry in the United States. In 1965, he said in public, burning fossil fuels is warming the planet. And by the year 2000, it could very well be totally out of our ability to control it. This is 1965. In the 19 early 1970s, Exxon's own scientists 
admitted that this was true, that their research was backing up what Frank Eichardt had said in 1965. But instead of saying, okay, we've got to find all, we're energy companies, let's find an alternate energy. They then hired PR people from the tobacco industry to start a campaign and they have, the fossil fuel industry has spent tens of billions of dollars in advertising and campaigns to say, no, 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 it's not true, it's not proved, uh, this is natural, um, it's not caused by burning fossil fuels, and it worked. Mm -hmm. For all these years, we have, as taxpayers have been subsidizing the industry and they've gone on making record profits and all by by uh, get, creating the sense that no, 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 it's it's not really proved. It's uh, no, 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 and it's all as Severn says. It's all about money. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and there's been so much damage to our planet. Do you think we're too far gone, or do you think there's a way to actually, you know, save our planet now? The planet isn't in trouble. This is the thing I people say. Oh, we got to save the planet. The planet's not in trouble. The planet did fine before there were human beings, and long after we're gone, and we will be gone, like all other species, we're going to go extinct. Uh, the uh, the planet is just going to go along. Now, the natural world is going to change dramatically. But as you know, we've had five periods in which up to 90% of all the species on our in the fossil record disappear um, in, in a matter of a couple million years. And uh, life recovers, nature recovers, radically different. But it takes about 10 million years for nature to come back again in diversity and abundance. Nature will certainly recover after humans are gone, but we have changed it dramatically. And the, the tragedy is it's no longer about are we going to be extinct or, or other species. We're, the, the question is, what is the future of our civilization? Yeah. It, within the next generation and we've run out of time the, the head of the united nations has said this is a code red alert for human beings this is a code red moment yeah absolutely well the good thing is that the david suzuki foundation is doing things to you know work on these issues so severin and david like how can people get involved and do their part and further your research well, it's not just the DSF, there's a whole legion of people who are working on this and it's amazing all the coalitions that uh, the David Suzuki Foundation is part of. Um, well, we're part of, we have lots of campaigns to push for policy change and to raise awareness at the federal, at the political level. So um, check out our website, sign up for the different campaigns that we're working on, get involved, check out the Future Ground Network. This is a place where engaged citizens can um, get, get access to some training, some support, you know, get trained up in how do you start a, a organizing in your community around um, the natural world and just start educating yourself about what you care about. And here's where we all have, we're all more most suited to make a difference is to follow what you are passionate about, what your skill set is, where, what you care about. And Climate change is affecting us in so many different levels. And chances are the thing that you care, the things that you really care about in your life are going to be affected by climate change, by ecosystem uh, diversity loss. So these things are areas that we will have a natural interest in, vested interest in. And that's where we're gonna make our best contribution. We need everybody in every domain to be starting to look at how to decarbonize. This is a huge project that all of us need to participate in, in our personal lives, in our sectors. This is a this is a, an issue of imagination and we need everybody to use their brains, use their imaginations to help us imagine a different future. Dariel, I, the, an overwhelming number of Canadians now believes, understands climate change is happening. And there, a lot of people are going from, you know, not understanding it to deny, to through denial and, and then despair. 
But if you look across Canada, the David Suzuki Foundation is just one small group among hundreds of groups all across Canada. And, and they're working in different areas because it's not just uh, nature that's being impacted. You know, we're all contributing to the problem and there are hundreds of groups working on different aspects of trying to change it. And it's the getting involved. It doesn't matter what group is much as empowering groups by the number of people supporting it. And that allows us to have real political pressure. This is not just some uh, special interest group. The impact of climate change is felt in the health area, in uh, in hunger and poverty, uh, in, in uh, social justice, all of these areas. Uh, are impacted by the uh, effects of climate change and people have got to be involved in whatever uh, intrigues them and we add up into something I think that really uh, that really matters. The important thing is we begin the change in our own lives mm -hmm. but we also become a part of a broad community telling our elected representatives do something and for me the big trigger is going to be when we as a society say we're in an emergency like when covid hit when covid hit suddenly our government began to spend not thousands not millions billions of dollars and i'm going where the heck did all this money come from you know as environmentalists we go to ottawa begging for a, a few million dollars for public transit and retrofitting houses and all that suddenly over covid the government has now spent 300 billion dollars holy cow money is not an issue and then you see that the government has done things and it hasn't been a political issue should we do this should we the government's been working together that's what we need is to say look look this is a crisis that that is uh, affecting all of us let's not get into your it's your fault you're bad guys let's come together now and let's declare we have to work on this like an emergency. That's why I've been supporting uh, Seth Klein, who wrote a book called The Good War. Not that wars are good, but look, he said, look at what Canada did during World War II. You know, in when we went to war in 1939, because we were part of the Commonwealth, we were this rinky-dink country of 11 million people. One million Canadians signed up to put their bodies on the line to go to war. You know, uh, we, in 1939, Canada produced 40 airplanes. By the end of the war, we had 130,000 people working in the aviation industry and lots of women were recruited to the workforce. We were the fourth largest aviation or aircraft manufacturer in the world. We set up 28 crown corporations to deal with what the private sector wasn't doing. Uh, when you say this is an emergency and we've just got to get on with solving it, all kinds of things happen. So that's what we've got to do is get us over the hill of denial or helplessness and say, it's an emergency. Now let's get on with dealing with it like it's an emergency. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. We all need to come together because it's definitely an emergency and I think we, we can all see that. <laughs> but Severn and David, thank you so much for being on the show today and sharing your insights. It's a pleasure and an honor to have both of you. Thanks a lot for having us. Tag TV is available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple and Android TVs, as well as on Apple and Android phones. Watch us live through YouTube and Facebook. You can fly high